This is a bit of an odd video. It is entitled Back of the TR8 or Back of the TR8S. And all will become clear very shortly. This was a reader's question. Um, actually, I had impure thoughts running through my mind then. <laughs> Those of you of a certain age might get the, get the drift there. Um, but before we start, <laughs> we must observe parish notices. If you um, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, why not? Hit the subscribe icon. If you want to be notified when content like this hits the channel, you know that that's the bell icon you want to click as well. If you like this video and you like other videos you see on the channel, you know what? Please give it a big thumbs up. It really helps. Um, consider becoming a member of the TMTG community. The address is down there as are the Instagram and the Facebook feeds. And I will be announcing uh, details of the competition on one of those feeds very, very shortly. Um, but they are the parish notices. Now back to the video. So why is this video called the back of the TRA or the back of the TRAS? It's because I got a question from somebody. And I was going to do it as part of Mailbag, but then I thought, actually, you know what? It's a bit more involved than mailbag. So I would do a video to answer the question. So here's the question. Um, how do the outputs and inputs on the back of the TR8, that's my TR8, compare with those of the TR8S? And that should be appearing there. And it, at first, it seems a bit of a weird question. But actually, when I actually did the research for this video, it made a lot of sense. Um, now, to be very clear before we start, yes, I own a TR8. There's my TR8. And there's the back of my TR8. OK, so I own one of those. I do not own a TR8S. I have thought about it, but I haven't got around to buying one. Um, so therefore, all the, the comments I'm going to make is based on research about the TR8S. And if I've got a couple, there's a couple of areas where I'm not really sure. So I've sort of kind of called that out. Um, so they may be a little bit inaccurate. But in general terms, I think I've pretty much covered what this question is. So to recap, what is the difference between the outputs and inputs on the back of the TR8 opposed to that of the TR8S? So what will actually appear, hopefully if I've got my dimensions right, the back of the TR8 should appear there, and the back of the TR8 should appear there. Right. This is this is all this is all done in post production, of course. You know, I am not holding. I'm not going to be holding this up like that while I'm doing it. Apart from the fact I'd have to hold it sort of over there so you can actually see things. <laughs> so, first of all, there are a number of common sockets between these two devices. Okay, and the common sockets are as follows. There is a quarter inch phono jack on both units. So that means you can use proper headphones, not headphones with the tiddly little jack. And people are going to be shouting at me for that, but I do actually like proper headphones with a quarter inch jack on them um, when I'm plugging into musical equipment. Call me old fashioned, but you know, I remember sitting there listening to my uh, record deck at the time with the headphones on. We'll come on to that reminiscing at some point in the future. There are also, on both units, a mix-out. That's a left and right feed, uh, both quarter-inch jacks. And basically, unless you change it by default, all the sounds generated by both units will come out of the mix-out. Okay, But you can change that. So theoretically, when you do a factory reset or you switch it on for the first time, all the sounds will come out of those mix-outs. There is an external in left and right. And that allows you to route the left and right feeds to the mix out on both units by default. However, you can change that on the S. Right, we'll come on to that in a minute. 
Okay, so there is a difference there. But by standard, by default, they both come out of the mix. There's a MIDI in, standard MIDI port. There's a MIDI out that can be reconfigured on both of them to be an out or a throw. Okay, so that's standard. And then there's a USB B socket. For those that don't know, that's the square. Well, what am I doing? That's the square socket. That one. Okay, a bit up there. Um, on both units, which is how you connect it to your computer or USB um, external connections, whatever you're doing. Okay. That's kind of where the similarity stops. Okay. Let's start with external routing. So as I said, both machines have an external in left and right okay the tr8 the signal is effectively sent through um even though you can add some sign chain to it as in it pumps the volume up on certain beats but effectively it's sent through from the external in to the mix out dry okay um whereby the external in um is it A? Yeah. No, it's not. Um, the external in left is sent to the external in left, and the external in right is sent to the external in right. Sorry, the, the mix out right, the mix out left. Okay. So, that's how the TR8 does it. And originally, the reason why it kind of did it that way was because in the original videos, I don't know whether you remember those from probably five years ago now, there were, you could plug the um, System 1 and the TB3 into those uh, left and right and effectively treat them as mono feeds, which was great if you're using, because they were baseline, so you could treat them as a mono feed. And they would come out on the, on the left and right channels um, on the TR8. The 8S adds in a few more bells and whistles to this process. First of all, the external A and the external in the external in A and the external in B can be treated differently. So you can either by default route them to the mix out, so left and right, A and B, or you can route them to an assignable out. And there are six assignable outs. In addition to being able to add side chain which you can do on the TR8 you can also add in reverb and delay to the signal so that's quite a big advantage if you have a limited rig in terms of what you can do is you could have a singer or a mic input on one of those and you can actually add some reverb and delay to actually make it a performance um, more of a performance signal than just having a dry signal running through. And you can have that coming out of one of the assignables. Okay, so you can have an assignable, route it to an assignable, add some delay, add some reverb, give the microphone to a singer, and route it off to a separate channel on the mixer. Okay, so that's one of the differences. The other thing you can do is, again, as I said, on here, it routes it dry, on the S, you can actually also add in master effects. So whatever you're doing on the total mix of the unit, you can add the assignable channels also to that uh, master effects that you're adding. As I said, you, you can route the signal to either the mix out or the assignable outs. And that can either be the left and right, so you can route it to assignable out A, assignable out B, or assignable out C, because they treat them in three groups of stereo uh, links. Or you can route them to assignable channels. So the um, the S allows has six, those six external outs that you can see up there are effectively separate assignable channels. So you can either assign the stereo feed in to an a stereo out, or you can say, this is a mono feed, and I want to go out one, and I want this mono feed to go out six. It gets a little bit more complicated. 
But that is the, ex is the key to the external routing. The next one is assignable outs. On the 8, you have two assignable outs, an A and a B. And you can go into the menu on the TR8 and you can say which instruments you want to go out the master mix, out the A channel or out the B channel. And bearing in mind, if it goes out the A channel, it goes out the B channel, everything on that channel goes out together. So you could have the bass on the bass drum on A because you want to treat that separately on the mix, the snare drum on B because you want to treat that separately on the mix, and the rest of the instruments going out through the master mix. Again, you can treat them slightly different on the mixer. And I've done that many, many times because that's kind of how this thing's set up. On the S, we're getting far more into the old school territory, but rather than have a jack that represents the bass drum, the snare drum, the hi hat, the 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 toms, etc. On the S, they're assignable, and you've got six of them. So you can have the bass drum on one, the snare on another, uh, the hi hat on another, uh, closed hat on another. Uh, I don't know maracas on another, whatever it happens to be. But you can have a different range of instruments. So effectively, you can have six instruments coming out separately, which you can plug into your desk separately, and then you have the rest of the instruments that come out the master mix. Okay, Or you can have multiple instruments coming out each one of the uh, assignables. So for argument's sake, you might want the marimba and the, and, the cow, uh, and the cow horn coming out the same assignable out. But effectively, they are routable within the software, within the unit, so you can cho choose what you want going in and out, as well as the signals that are coming in from the external sources. So again, you could have your TB3 plugged into it and, and have that running the baseline on one of the assignables, as well as instruments coming out of it. That's the first way the assignables work on the S, because on the, on the 8, as it was, that's pretty much, you can only assign the, the instruments to an A or a B, and that's it. The assignables on the S can also be used as trigger channels. So you can pick an instrument, you can put it into your step sequencer when you want that instrument to trigger, and then you can change the output to a trigger out, not an instrument out. So effectively at that point, it's sending a voltage not a um, not a sound. So you need to be really careful with this because if you start sending voltages to a mixer, you're liable to blow a channel. Whereas if you send voltages to, I don't know, an SH-101 or a Jupiter or something like that, um, something that requires a trigger, uh, old style 808 for argument's sake, then you can actually get it to trigger an instrument every time that um, instrument is attached to the step um, sequencer. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense to somebody. Um, I'm, I'm kind of in two minds about how I would use this if I had it. Um, in fact, I'm kind of in two minds whether I would use it if I had it, but it is there, it is present on the unit, and you can um, trigger external units of the step sequencer doing that. So it's going back to a bygone era where the sequencer generated triggers and depending on how you were doing it, whether it was control voltage or it was just trigger, you could trigger other instruments. And I haven't been in that environment for a long, long time. The other way you can configure the assignables is to actually take a stereo patch. Now I say that in, in this kind of way, because the S allows sampled patches to be triggered based on the pads. So not only do you have ACB, as in analog circuitry behavior modeling for the instruments that are on the TR8S, you can also have a stereo sample being triggered, and you can assign that either to the multi-mix or you can assign that to the uh, an assignable out. I'm hoping that kind of makes sense to everyone. 
Okay, this is this is the this is the complicated bit. Well, I don't think it's complicated, but it is. It kind of sounds complicated. So the next thing you look at on the back of the S is you'll notice that there is a three eighths inch jack, which is called trigger out. Okay, and what that jack does is effectively it fires on every step of the step sequencer. Effectively, it's a time code. So if you need something like an arpeggiator that needs to be in sync with your drum machine, your TR-8S, this thing will fire out a steady uh, clock on every beat of the step sequencer. So you can keep your arpeggiator, arpeggiator in sequence with your drums. Not to be confused with the assignable outs, because the triggers there only happen when the instrument on the step sequencer is triggered. So the trigger out is every every step and the assignable out is only when the instrument is attached to a step. Hopefully that works. Okay. This one should be fairly obvious. SD card reader. So one of the biggest problems with the ARIA range as it was was you sat there and you crafted your banks of uh, drum patterns on your TR-8S or your TB3 or um, your System 1, but you couldn't back them up. <laughs> and actually, it was one or two patches in that Roland actually released the functionality to allow you to back it up, Okay, because it wasn't there on the base, I suppose, because they didn't think people wanted it. Um, so... The way you did it on the TR8S is effectively you plug it into your computer, you put the TR8S into uh, backup and restore mode, and therefore you can then access the folders on this to actually grab your patches out and then you would zip them up for whenever you needed them for performance. Or just to preserve them in case you did a numpty thing like do a factory reset because you would lose them all at that point. The S... Obviously, they thought about that a little bit further. And while they could have put an SD card in this, because SD cards were around in 2015 when this thing was released, so they could have put an SD card in there, but they didn't think about it. Um, in the S, they've put an SD card. So effectively, the SD card allows you to back up and restore whatever's on the, on the um, uh, TR-8S. Now, what's really interesting is I'm not 100% sure of this because I don't have an S, I've never done it, whether you can actually change the file name because all the literature seems to sort of like be tr8out.bin, um, bin uh, bin being the uh, the zip file that these things are put into. Um, so I'm not sure um, whether you can change the file name or not and rename it. So you might have to rename the file name to the file to another name for storage because otherwise it is a waste of an SD card um, just backing up one patch to one SD card. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, let's look at some very, very clear differences between the 8S and the 8. Now the first thing you notice about the 8 is it's sort of got slopey sides to it. It's sort of kind of a, a wedge shape. Whereas if you look at the 8S, it's very square. And it's designed to lie a lot flatter on the table than the uh, 8 is. And I've, I think, if memory serves me correct, I think it's uniform. So if I were to put this up against the camera like that, you can see this is a wedge that way as well. Whereas that is pretty uniform flat. Uh, it's designed to sit a lot flatter on the table. Um, so that's the first thing you notice about it. The second thing you notice is that although both units have ACB, um, effectively what's on here is on there, um, the S also has this sample capability where you can load samples in to it from a sample library. Uh, and it will allow you to, to to assign those samples to the instrument pads, so you can trigger a sample. So it's getting into kind of the territory of the groove box. Um, 
I'm not sure he does it as well as the groove box though. And given I don't own an S and I don't own a groove box, I have to sort of caveat that and say, from the videos I've seen, I'm not sure it does. But you know, somebody out there who has an S may say it does. Duh. So that's that. The other thing you notice about the S as opposed to the 8 is the 8 has a very simple interface there. The S has, a, although it's limited in terms of how many characters, it does have a too high LCD display on it, which actually gives you far more information about the, what the unit is doing than this thing does. And if I were to say one of the biggest improvements between this and that, or this and that, is the fact that on here, or on this, I've got it here, it's, it's confusing, but on this thing, in order to make something happen, it's a series of um, button presses. So, you know, you press the kit button and the PTN select, or you press something and something else. And that makes you, puts you into the mode to perform a function. Very reminiscent of what you used to do with the, the 808 and the 909. It was a series of button pressures. Whereas on the S, it's far more driven by the menu that appears in the LCD. Now, I'm kind of think in some ways that's better the problem you have, I suspect, is that things are, are disappear into different menu structures. Um, and that's always a pain, uh, especially on limited uh, graphical interfaces or an LCD interface. So that's, that's kind of better and worse. Whereas on this, you know, if you know that the, the key press is like that or that, you know, you can do that very quickly. Problem is, at a glance, you can't tell what mode this thing is in. And at a glance, you can tell what mode this thing is in. So, I am hoping that that answers your question. If it doesn't, you know what, drop me a line. And on that note, my usual greeting, live long and prosper. Catch you next time.